pastor, theologian, scholar, and regular Good Catholic contributor, Father Jeffrey Kirby, joins Good Catholic's Rachel Schrader on the Truth Be Bold podcast, a fearless, down-to-earth weekly discussion on the topics at the forefront of our Catholic life today. Greetings, friends. This is Father Jeff Kirby, along with Rachel Schrader, and you are joining us for the podcast, Truth Be Bold. Now, this is a podcast where we dive into the real issues facing Catholics in the trenches, It's not easy living as Catholic Christians in the midst of a secular age. There are all kinds of questions that come up. In our podcast, we want to go and just dive right in, have an open conversation, a discussion. And believe it or not, our first topic, which is the most pressing topic we find pastorally, and can surprise people, is actually the grievance and the sorrow we feel when loved ones leave the faith. Now, you can imagine all those pastoral issues, all the moral issues we face, as Christians in the midst of a secular age, this is number one. That can surprise you, it surprises most people. So we wanna dive right into that and address this question. So Rachel, did it surprise you that that's the number one pastoral issue? It actually didn't because this is a highly requested topic on Good Catholic. And I know this is something that people do wanna hear about. And all of us, I think in every family, I feel has some relative that's fallen away from the faith. We have friends that we see fall away from the faith. And so this is something I feel that touches every family almost immediately, at least by secondary, you know, you know somebody who knows who has a family member who's fallen away. So yes, it's it's a pretty intense topic. Yeah, I think why there's like such a punch for most people with this issue is we're not just talking about the sorrow of a loved one not being with us for mass or not celebrating feast days of our liturgical year. Uh, which could be difficult enough, like not having loved ones with us mm-hmm. when we worship God or celebrate aspects of our faith. But it also touches eternity. Absolutely. That there's also this question of what's going to happen to my loved one when they die? Will, will they be with me in heaven? So it both is a is a real concrete experience you know, in terms of our, our, our sorrow and, and grief and, and, and over this uh, absence, but also What's going to happen in eternity? So, so we definitely wanted to pick this question up and, and, and just give some thoughts and, and, and approaches uh, to this. Now, what I'd like to do is, is I think that first we have to make sure we know our own faith. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I think it's also very important that we understand the pastoral approach that we want to have mm-hmm. when people left the faith. So uh, believe it or not, and this might shock some people, um, shame and nagging don't work. <laughs> you know, Catholic moms have tried it for generations. It doesn't work. So, so we're going to talk about maybe some things that could work, right? And and then also, I think on our podcast, we want to make sure we address the spiritual approach because mm-hmm. that's the one that's oftentimes ignored. Right. So we can have our faith and we can apply pastoral skills to, to our, our loved ones, but then we're not praying for them. Right. So the mm-hmm. most powerful thing we have as Catholic Christians oftentimes isn't used or isn't used as consistently. So we just want to make sure we address that. So, so Rachel, I was thinking maybe we'd just talk maybe a little about a little bit about our own discipleship as a as a, a preface to reaching out to loved ones. Sounds like a great place to start. Good. So, and, and of course, as soon as we mentioned that, <laughs> we might get uncomfortable because this is the part of this conversation that affects us. Because we don't want to fall into condescension or uh, self-righteousness. We don't want to think somehow, well, uh, we are the elite and these poor slobs over here, even people we might happen to love, uh, are beneath us and so on. So we have Mm -hmm. to humble ourselves a little bit because (laughs) biblical wisdom tells us God rejects the proud even when they're right. Yes. So, (laughs) so, (laughs) so, So first we want to humble ourselves and... We want to ask, where are we in terms of our discipleship? Mm-hmm. Because we can't give what we don't have. Right. I, I'm very encouraged. Uh, the story is told in the early parts of Acts of the Apostles, where Peter and John, they're on their way back from the temple. They were praying in, in what we now actually call the Liturgy of the Hours. And they were on their way back from the temple. And they see this poor man who starts to beg for money. And you know, Peter tells him, says, look, I, I don't have silver and gold. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise and walk, and the man is healed. Mm-hmm. And and that story is powerful on many different levels. And I think from that we can discern the now biblical principle that we cannot give what we do not have. If I don't have silver and gold, I can't give it to you. Mm-hmm. If I don't have a discipleship of Jesus Christ and an act of witness to him, I can't give that to you. 
So I think the first place to make sure we avoid any sense of self-righteousness in our own hearts or how we approach others is a question of our own discipleship. Where are we in terms of our relationship with Jesus Christ? And I'll tell you, Rich, you, you might have seen this as well uh, in, in Catholic company and so on, is a lot of times parents especially will say, applying this questioning of their own discipleship, I'm pretty sure my adult children are not practicing the faith because I really wasn't the best of witness when they were being raised. Mm -hmm. There was work, there were other things. I really wasn't a very good disciple of Jesus Christ mm -hmm. when I was raising them. Yeah. And that seems to really sometimes uh, be a particular grievance I hear mm -hmm. uh, from parents. Right. But they're doing that. They're doing the work we're talking, which is where are we in our discipleship? We can't give what we don't have. Where are we in our on our own faith? So first, are we living it? Are we trying to show joy? Are, are, are we showing a spirit of mercy and, and kindness? Or do we live like the unbelievers, right? So we, 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 we don't pray, but we talk about God. We talk about him, but not to him, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> in our everyday lives. Uh, we are as judgmental and rude and mean-spirited as the unbeliever. We're not even trying to fight it. You know? Right. And, mm -hmm. and so someone could look and say, well, if that's Jesus Christ, <laughs> mean-spirited, rude, condescending. I don't want that, yeah, right? Yes. I mean, who wants that? <laughs> you know? So as, as one unbeliever told me, uh, their experience was every Christian they met was miserable. Oh. And they said, why would I take on more rules and things for me to do Mm -hmm. If all of this is just going to make me more miserable, That's, I mean, it's, it's logic. It's fair, <laughs> right? right? You know, so you, you, with our discipleship, we can ask, you know, are, are we expressing the joy that we're called to? Right, mm -hmm. and, and that can be hard because you know we can be faithful disciples, doing our best, but yet not be joyful. And mm -hmm. so I, I love the the story from Mother Teresa of Calcutta. She said, "Sometimes the greatest gift we can give to another is, is a smile." And sometimes we can forget that. And, and and let's let's you know be kind to ourselves in that sometimes there's good reason for that. Like we've got bills to pay, we're stressed out, we're worried, we're anxious, but but yeah, we have to remind ourselves, none of these things as a Christian define me. So I have to die to myself and I have to make sure I show the joy of what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Right. I think it was Mother Teresa who said, God doesn't want any long faced saints. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. And unfortunately we might have a lot of those. You know? <laughs> So, so I think that first question is our just our discipleship, and then with that is our own knowledge of the faith. Mm -hmm. Because here's here's the sad part of the world we live in: if someone asks us a question and we don't have an answer, they assume that there is not an answer, or they assume that whatever we are standing up for, such as the gospel of Jesus Christ, is somehow insufficient. It cannot provide an answer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I think that stand, and that's a challenge in our age right now. And I think that with that, St. Peter tells us in the New Testament, always have an answer for the hope that dwells within you. Now, we can't all know our entire faith, mm -hmm. uh, but we can at least know the relative basics of our faith. We can know the resources of our faith, because I think we still live in a time where we can say, I don't know the, the answer to that, but I know there is an answer. Yes, I think that's a good response and say, I can get you an answer to that. Or these are the resources that I often use to address those sorts of issues. Yes. And, and, and from that, to know those resources, all oh, the sacred scriptures, the catechism of the Catholic Church mm -hmm. and so on. And of course, there are many other resources. Uh, the Companion of, of Catholic Social Doctrines is a very uh, helpful resource. Of course, I always just point to, I say it's a left and, and right punch in that we have the sacred scriptures and the catechism of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a challenge in being good disciples, so living the way of the Lord Jesus, but then also learning about our faith. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's nothing worse than <laughs> an a, a adult parent trying to give witness to their adult child and saying, well, uh, you need to come back to Mass because it's really important, and the person saying, well, why? right? And the parent not have an answer or to say something, to say something like, well, because God's going to be angry with you and bad things are going to happen. <laughs> okay. right? that's, that's, that's not a good answer. Right? You know what I mean? So, so in a large part, it's, it's the gut instinct because, you know, the person has, has lived a life mm -hmm. and maybe their faith has been 
uh, so stable that they've never had to ask that hard question. Like, yeah, why, why yeah. do we go to mass? Yeah, what is the real reason behind this? Yes. Yeah. So in terms, in terms of, of discipleship and knowledge of the faith, um, I'm not sure why Catholics aren't doing it. The cate catechesis has been failing a lot in the last several decades, but there are resources out there and we should know our faith. We should read our faith. We should study our faith. St. Thomas is another favorite of mine ah, yes. um, for finding clear answers to questions yes. because he's wrote about basically everything. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and written almost perfectly. Right? Mm -hmm. I mean, to be called the angelic doctor is pretty awesome. Right? Yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, he probably wrote very correctly on a lot of things. <laughs> wrote, you've, you've written well with me, Thomas, as Christ said to him. Yes. Um, yeah. So yeah, I think I think the lack of catechesis is a serious problem with the faith, and so I think making up for that with the resources that are just as available to us as they mm -hmm. always have been. Yes. We have the catechism, we have instruction, we have sacred scripture, we have Thomas, we have good resources like Father Kirby. And um, so getting better educated in our faith is something that should be an ongoing process for all of us, even if we think we're well educated. Yes, so. I oftentimes think, just even as a, as a disciple and a priest, because if I'm not careful, I can live in a very small Catholic bubble. Mm -hmm. yes. And so I try to ask myself, what is the challenge or the question that the fallen away Catholic or the unbeliever can ask? Mm -hmm. Because for me, it makes complete sense because, well, I'm living my life according to our faith. But to pose that challenge, and I think it could be a healthy practice for every disciple. Mm -hmm. Why, if I had to convince someone why this is important or why this is beneficial mm -hmm. or why this is a part of the Christian way of life, I have to make sure I have that answer ready. And, yes. and I think that can be maybe a question where as we're learning our faith and evaluating, examining our discipleship, that can be the question. If I had to explain this, why, what is the importance of Sunday Mass? Mm -hmm. or what is the importance of prayer? Why should I follow the moral teachings of the mm -hmm. Lord Jesus and his church? Mm -hmm. Asking these questions, I, I think, can be a healthy practice because then we find the answers, first of all, in feeding our own faith. But then we are asked, we can be rather than, uh, 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 we can say, <laughs> I'm really glad you asked. Okay, yeah. you know, one A, one B, one C, right? <laughs> you know, and, and I think that would um, that zeal and that readiness, I, I think, could definitely pay off. You know, um, well, we talk about our faith and, and, and knowledge. And I think the second part that we really have to be moved to is when we want to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And uh, one person recently said to me, uh, "St. Paul says, speak the truth in love," and they said, well, the love part is the challenge, but also the speaking is the challenge, right? So so sometimes we think, okay, the challenge is we're going to speak, but we have to speak in love. That is a challenge. But they said the, the real challenge now is actually just speaking, right? Mm -hmm. Just taking that first step. Yeah, and it's one thing I feel that afflicts all of us is being really concerned about what we're going to say and how, how to say it. And obviously we think about it and we study and we practice, but... Also, I'm always reminded, I think it's in Luke's gospel, that Christ says you're going to be dragged before governors and synagogues for my sake. And don't think about beforehand what you're going to say, because I will give you what to say in that moment. The Spirit will be speaking through you. Mm -hmm. um, which isn't to say that we never, we don't even bother studying and we're just going to assume the Spirit's going to speak through us. So we do our due diligence, but we also realize that this is God's work in the end yes. and that we're just instruments. Yes, yes, that's very well said. And, and I want us to talk about the spiritual approach too. And, and I think that that approach has to pervade everything else we do. Mm -hmm. So even our conversations with our loved ones to say, the success of this conversation has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. Whether or not my loved one accepts the saving message that's not mine, that I'm passing on, whether that person, this loved one accepts or rejects is between them and God. Absolutely. And their conversion is going to happen because of the workings of God, not me. Mm -hmm. right? you know? And even if you can't see the fruit of it, you might have sown a seed. So it's, there's no reason to be discouraged if things don't, you don't get an instantaneous road yeah, to Damascus yeah. type of conversion. Yeah, and Rich, I think that's a really good point because, you know, so oftentimes we can, um, someone else reaps what we sow. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes spiritually God allows that to keep us humble. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> because sometimes a soul needs a lot of seeds before they say yes. Mm -hmm. And so we can be sharing the gospel and, and speaking the truth in love and, and offering constant invitations. And then all of a sudden, 
their coworker or some random person that they know in their life says, hey, you should go to mass. And they say, yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so, what? No, no, no. Our witness was a part of that. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, we you know? a little bit of that. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? so, so, well, we want to talk a little bit about when we want to have the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'd like to do is maybe point out a, a, a few pointers that might help. Yeah. You know, that, mm -hmm. that you know, I've picked up along the way in, in, in my pre ministry. People have shared things with me and, of course, in my own reading and research. Mm -hmm. You know, and then you know, I think the one of the things that's first stressed is the importance of active listening. And this can be very hard because when we're given a message that's absolute, meaning it's perfect. This is a heavenly message, a divine message given to us by the God-made man. So it's a perfect message. So because we know it's perfect, oftentimes we can be very impatient right? mm -hmm. uh, when we're trying to share it with someone because we know that the problem is not with the message, it's with us, right? right? Mm -hmm. And but with that said, we have to be aware of that, keep our own pride in check, and just listen to the person. Like, why, why did you stop going to Mass? Uh, what, what, why, why do you say you don't believe in Jesus Christ anymore? Like, why do you say you don't believe in God anymore? And then humble ourselves. And, and, and sometimes with some family members, not on this topic, but just in general, I'm talking, I even just physically put my finger <laughs> over my mouth, right? You know, it's just a reminder. It's like, shh. This is listen time. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. Because uh, it is hard when it's people we love, we know mm -hmm. them, and some of them we've known them their whole lives. You mm -hmm. know, um, but yet listen. Like you've asked a question. Mm -hmm. Listen. Right. Actively listen. Yeah, and that's critical to your response because it's important to really understand the why. If you really understand the why they left the faith, that's going to to color your approach in a certain sense. Yes, yes. and we might be surprised when we start listening because. Again, many of these family members, if they're siblings or nieces and nephews or cousins or for parents, adult children, you know, we have known them their whole lives or most of their lives. And we might be very surprised mm -hmm. to hear a whole aspect of their life or their understanding of God or their understanding of the faith that we've never known. Right. And, and suddenly we hear things and, oh, oh. I never thought about that, or I didn't know that happened, or I didn't mm -hmm. know that that's how you thought about these mm -hmm. things. And so yeah. I think this active listening can be a huge part. And I want to stress uh, that uh, important word, active listening. Um, because when we're listening to the person, we want to show a sincere and open heart. So we, we've all been in conversations where someone has asked us a question, and then they're like this. <laughs> or something, right, you know what I mean? Get, like, you know, they're just like, exactly, they're like ready to pounce, you know what I yeah. mean? It's just like, I'm not giving you anything to yeah. use against me, right? Yeah. You know? So, so I just think the, the, the active listening and, and, you know, that kind of openness of heart that has to be a part of it. And, and almost in a sense of putting down all, all, all of our defenses, mm -hmm. realizing that our hurt is not a part of this conversation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And saying, what is going on? in this life of this person that I love, the life of this person that God loves, mm -hmm. and listen actively. And I just think that's that can be very difficult for many people because, again, these are loved ones and we think we know them. Mm, yeah. With that active listening, I think the second part that's a huge aspect of this is as we're listening, we don't want to find accusations to use against them. Right? Mm -hmm. So they say, well, mass is boring or it never contributed anything to my life. And we know how important the, the holy sacrifice of the mass is. We know how important uh, the contribution of the gospel is to our life. And, and so, again, we want to just kind of react and, and defend and, mm -hmm. and so on. And, and I think that we have to just die to that. And instead, as we're actively listening, what we have to look for is what are the bridges, the connections that I have with this person that I love, that we can speak about. Like mm -hmm. what can help this conversation to remain peaceful and amicable? Mm -hmm. you know, the, the joke is told about Pope St. John Paul II that no matter who, whom, whoever he spoke to, he could find something that he could relate to that was shared uh, that could be a bridge to conversation. Mm -hmm. So much so that the joke was that 
if he was speaking to cannibals, <laughs> he would be able to say, yes, yes, it's, it's very important that we have daily amounts of protein. <laughs> but you know what I mean? like, he, would, he would look for something to try to connect with the person so that heart can speak to heart to mm -hmm. heart. And, and, you know, so for example, someone says, well, you know, mass is boring and my, I have a busy life and so on. To be able to say, you know, there are times I have felt that. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, honestly, you know, and, and so right. So I think that you know that that connection I think is so important that after we've done listening and they're done sharing, that we then say, okay, what what what's the connection, right? So rather than not launching in a defensive posture or or with accusations, instead to say, what do I share with what this person has has given to me? What 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 is in common? Right. And I think what you said about it being peaceful and amicable, I think it's important to remember always that this is going to happen according to God's timeline, because I think naturally we want to win conversations. Right. And naturally we want this conversion to happen like we want. We want to deliver the one two punch so that they'll they'll say, oh, that's the truth and come back to it. And we really want that to happen. And realizing that, you know, this conversation might not be the it's the first. It may probably won't be the last. And this might be a whole series of conversations it might take days, months, years. And we have to keep going with it and realizing that we are we are fighting a war, but against principalities and powers. And we're not fighting a war against this person. Yes. And that we have to maintain that atmosphere of that, that heart of peace, I feel, that, that calm heart, that yes. calm interior with all of this. So. Yes, yes. I, I, I very much appreciate what you just said, Rachel, that you know, not the powers and principalities. Uh, that, me, that is what we're fighting, not the person in front mm -hmm. of us. Like, and, and that's so important because oftentimes as I think about my own extended family or pastoral situations of parishioners where the reaction of the person to their loved one, um, you imagine like, you know, what, what, how did you possibly think that would ever convince them to come back to the faith when you started yelling at them and guilting them and shaming them? And so I'm like, <laughs> do you really think that would work? You know? And, uh, and, and, you know, we almost have to pause and say, I love this person. Like, I, I want them to come back because I know the power of God's grace. I know the power of the gospel. I, mm -hmm. I want them to have the abundant life that, that Jesus Christ offers to us. And, and, and I want them to be with me in heaven. Right. right? So, so, you know, we can say, I love this person and whatever they might throw. And sometimes people say, can say hurtful things. Mm -hmm. or they purposely try to, to say things that are derogatory or, or in mockery of the faith or things yes, that are sacred. Mm -hmm. And I think yet we have to remind ourselves in the midst of that, like, I love this person and whatever they're throwing at us, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, uh, maliciously or attempting to be of kind spirit that we have to realize as, as you were stressing, quoting, this is from St. Paul, that we're, we're battling that, mm -hmm. that, 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 that spirit, that power, that principality, uh, that fallenness, that evil, that wickedness, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And and that allows us to address the problem or the challenge, but to do it in the spirit of Christ. Right. Rachel, I'm amazed how many people think that they're fighting for the kingdom of God with a spirit contrary to God. <laughs> it's, like, yeah. it's like you can't spread his kingdom mm -hmm. if you're not trying to have his heart. Right? Yes, you know exactly. I mean? so, so in these conversations, we have to try to actively listen. We try to find a connection. We use what we have in common in order to, to show, okay, I do understand this is one part of what you, you have given that, that I can agree with. And as you were saying also, Rachel, that, that we just, we wait. Um, mm -hmm. If we think one conversation is going to convince someone who's been away from the faith for five years, six years, 10 years to say, oh yeah, my goodness, you're so smart. Yes, yeah, I need to start going to mass. Thank you so much. <laughs> It's not going to happen unless yeah. the Holy Spirit determines for that to happen. It does but, happen sometimes. Yeah, it but does. It's usually because of a road to Damascus moment or some grace of God. It's not because of our cleverness, usually. Right, right, right. And, yeah. and, and as we said earlier, it's almost like we've just hopefully given some prefaces to whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. So, mm -hmm. And I think that, that leveling of expectations can also be helpful that to think, well, if I sit down and I share my faith and I'm, I'm, I'm listening to them and so on, well, then and okay well that means they're going to come back now mm -hmm. and again that, that we're trying to emphasize that that's not up to us so that's maybe the, the pastoral approach we've spoken about discipleship and knowing our faith and then we spoke about this pastoral approach as we're trying to keep channels open conversations sincere and amicable is a part of this and now maybe we can just kind of begin to conclude our conversation with uh addressing the spiritual mm -hmm. okay and I think 
a lot of Catholic Christians don't realize the resources we have and really the powerful call that we can sometimes receive from God. So for example, to be an intercessor for someone is a powerful call to, as the scriptures say, to lift holy hands and to offer supplications mm -hmm. for someone. Yeah. Uh, I think of the Old Testament where, you know, Moses is, he has his hands up and, and, and the Israelites are winning and he starts to lower his hand and they're losing and he lifts it up and they're winning and he lowers it and eventually, you know, uh, Aaron and, and, and another holy man has to hold, hold his shoulders up, his, mm -hmm. his elbows up, you know, so, so that he, you know, that Israel can win. And in many respects, that's the, the call mm -hmm. of, of the intercessor that when we're praying for our loved ones, we're interceding for our loved ones, it, it's like having our hands extended. And sometimes we get weary. Mm -hmm. Gosh, it's been years and they just haven't even come back or, you know, it's been years and they're still so just, you know, malicious towards the faith and, mm -hmm. and, and belief in God and so on. It's easy to, to let our hands, our arms start to droop, right? Uh, and yet we have to hold them up um, by holy fellowship with others, other members of our family, but also there are specific practices we can do mm -hmm. that can help. So so we have this call, and, and I want to just maybe give a quick list of, of some of the resources, and, and, and you probably have some more because this list is not holistic. It's, it's <laughs> just some of the things that I'm aware of and, and have found helpful, actually. Mm -hmm. So um, first of all, I mentioned Having masses offered for them. Great idea. It, it's amazing. We can offer masses for people who are living. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Masses do not only have to be for the dead. Right. Uh, Rich, you'd be shocked the, at the parish. The majority of the masses are for the dead, which is a noble practice. Mm -hmm. But often we forget. Like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> this is for the living as well. Yes, exactly. Like, Father, what can I do? My adult son has you know, come to mass. Have a mass offered for him. It's the greatest prayer. It's the greatest thing you can do for them. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. Powerful. So I say, you know, I'll have masses offered. If your local parish is booked up, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, reach out to religious orders. Mm -hmm. uh, so sometimes when people have urgent uh, mass intentions uh, at my parish and, and we're full, mm -hmm. I would direct them to a local monastery that's good or idea. to a religious order. There, there are places where masses can be offered. So I think that's one thing to have masses offered. Right. And you can yeah. always offer intentions within a mass, even if the mass itself isn't for that person. You yes. can always, you know, offer it personally for a certain person. Yeah, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yes. For your and, communion and, as well. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. And the moments of consecration, reception of Holy Communion, mm -hmm. very much. Yes. So don't underestimate the power of the Eucharistic sacrifice. <laughs> Uh, this is literally the Lord Jesus representing him, his sacrifice to the Father and, and to offer our loved ones to pray for them. That I think is, it is the sum and the source of everything else. You know? The other thing I want to mention is adoration. So, and this has a twofold adoration, meaning we're going to adoration, praying for them. So this is prayer before the blessed sacrament, or we are inviting them to adoration. Right now, research is telling us that more Catholics were falling away are more inclined to come to adoration than to mass. Hmm. Because what happens, adoration, you just get to come and sit and be in prayer yourself with God. Yeah. So the average fallen away Catholic, again, is more inclined to come to adoration. Now that that's just a helpful little piece of information because we can be asking our loved ones to come back to mass and they keep saying no. And we think, oh, what am I, what am I gonna do? Well, how about inviting them to adoration? That's a great idea. Yeah. Less intimidating. For yeah, some. less intimidating. There's fewer people there. You, you feel like it's just kind of you and God. You're not don't feel like people are judging you or or anything like that. And yeah. it's, it's just a nice reflective time. And people like that anyway. Like with the the rat race of the world yeah. going on, going and being God's presence and just being peaceful. And then after adoration, oftentimes we can forget that you know the rosary is a very powerful yes, prayer the form. weapon. Yes, yes. You know, we put Our Lady on it. You know, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, cover our loved ones in, in her mantle. Mm -hmm. uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet is another resource, yep. especially if there's a situation where our loved ones might be in grave sin, mm -hmm. and and there's a real battle with those powers and principalities, yeah. and, and so on. So, the Divine Mercy Chaplet of Chaplet. Saint Michael is one of my favorite devotions. Yes. as well. it's a great one against the. The powers of the netherworld. Yeah, I just was introduced to that this past year. Isn't it wonderful? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, yeah. So put St. Michael on it as well. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, also, novena to specific saints. So mm -hmm. maybe our loved ones uh, name saint or their confirmation saint or uh, more popular saints such as St. Monica. Everybody goes to St. <laughs> Monica, Monica for loved ones. Mm -hmm. uh, but there can be other novenas as well that might be dear to the person that we love or to our family. Also, uh, the green scapular. Uh, many Catholics may not be aware yeah. that the green scapular is mm -hmm. both for health but also conversion. In fact, um, older Catholics tell me that it used to be in a home 
if you walked into a Catholic home and you saw pictures and so on, and if in the corner of the frame there was a green scapular, Catholics would know that that person had left the faith. Oh, wow. That the family was offering prayers for them. So huh. maybe we could be a little more discreet. You can put it, <laughs> you, you, you can put it be, behind the frame, you know what I mean? But uh, but just use the green scapular, either giving it to the person or in their you know their image, their picture, we can have the green scapular. So that's a, a, a an immediate spiritual resource we have in the church. The miraculous medal as well. Uh, I know one holy couple, every time they go to their uh, son's home, their adult son who's cohabitating with his girlfriend, uh, they go and they just drop miraculous medals in the couch <laughs> and, and various things, you know. So, so that can be a resource as well, uh, putting Our Lady on it. Um, prayers uh, specifically to Saint Monica. So again, she's a great intercessor for those who have left the pray the, the practice of the faith, uh, or or again other prayers beyond novenas uh, to specific saints, and also prayers to our loved one's guardian angel. So Padre Pio was big on this. I, I love this practice that he definitely popularized that we pray to the guardian angels of our loved ones they're always with them and just ask our guardian angel please bring them back to mass please bring them back to uh, an awareness of the faith mm -hmm. bring them back to fellowship with god so there are more spiritual resources but those are just some that again i've kind of picked up along the way and i found helpful either myself or uh in, in my priesthood so um so yeah rachel what do you think about all this Excellent. Some fantastic resources, both spiritual and pastoral and practical for talking to our loved ones who have fallen away from the faith. But the, there's there's some, there's some things that I, I'm, I'm going to be a little contrarian Good. right now. I love the way that St. Thomas explains things in his Summa because he starts with an idea and then he goes to the, the, the contras, like mm. common objections to what he might be saying, which I think is a great way of explaining the truth. So I kind of followed his lead and came up great. with a couple of contras myself. So... Probably one of the most common responses you might get to somebody who's kind of gone off and done their own thing and fallen away from the faith is, you know, to each his own, I'm doing my thing, you do your thing, and we'll just not talk about it. Like, it's none of your business. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. And I would say um, that all makes sense until we realize that we are made in God's image. And by that, we are made for love and to give love. And when we are love in, when we love someone, when they love us, we know that we are then called to what the Lord described in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mm -hmm. That we we can't say I'm going to leave them by themselves. I mean, you can imagine if you know someone's eating something and they really like what they're eating, but we know it's poison, like they're dying. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like we just exactly. take, take that poison away. You know, um, and so I think that you know love compels us uh, to to break, you know, whatever template our world has given to us so yeah, live and let live mind your own business and so on it's like well that that just doesn't work and, and that's never been the approach of love uh, love says no I, I i am a part of your life you're a part of my life and part of that means that uh, sometimes we have to have awkward conversations you know so yeah so i'd say to, to people um if they say it's none of your business say it is my business because i love you and you're a huge part of my life and I really want us to talk about this, so. Okay, but I'm afraid I'm gonna scare them off. I'm like, I'm really afraid I'm gonna scare them off. So what if I just keep quiet and lead by example? That's all I can do. Okay, so I will say that there are probably good times where we can be more spiritual and, and passive in our approach than active. And I do think that even our love, as I've, I've just addressed, our love has to be guided by prudence. So St. Thomas says that the three most important virtues are faith, hope, and love. These are theological virtues that are given to us at baptism. The Holy Spirit infuses them right into our soul. But Thomas Aquinas will say that after the three theological virtues, the most important virtue is prudence. Mm, yeah. So it's the first of what we call the cardinal virtues. So we have to allow even our love and our outreach to be ordered by prudence. So there are times where we are strategic in our invitations, or we are you know, less direct. So for example, um, an invitation to mass can be, you know, periodic rather than every week, Yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we have one very deep conversation, that doesn't mean we call two days later and say, let's keep talking. <laughs> you can let it sit, you know, mm -hmm. allow the, the seeds to, to germinate a little bit. Um, so I do think there's there can be some valid approach there as long as it really is the exercise of prudence and not an indulgence to fear. Because the Holy Spirit can't work in fear. Yeah. You know, so, yep. 
What if the situation is a little reversed and the person who's away from the faith is the very belligerent one? What if they want to come over and just argue about this stuff? Yeah. And it causes pain, it causes discord. Like they come over to the Thanksgiving table or whatever and they're that person who really wants to argue about things and tell you you're wrong. And how, how do you draw this? Maybe this is a bigger topic that we can get into here, but um, like how do you how do you deal with that? How do you, do, how do you draw those boundaries? I think of like Cousin Eddie off of the movie Christmas Vacation. Oh. <laughs> you know, I think we all have kind of a, a crazy Cousin Eddie um, who's similar to what you're describing, mm -hmm. who comes and can be belligerent and either intentionally or even unintentionally. And, and I think that we have to guard the sacred. Uh, we don't throw our pearls before swine, as the Lord tells us. So I think that we try to be as strategic. And, and sometimes we can forget that there can be an exercise of love that includes avoidance. So what passionately we call charitable avoidance. More properly, we could, we could say small doses. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? so, so sometimes, again, we can be prudential in how we approach the person uh, in terms of our interaction or the forum that we give them in terms mm -hmm. of uh, what they can say especially if they're being derogatory uh, intentionally. Mm -hmm. And I would say this is particularly true of Christian parents mm -hmm. if their children are still uh, impressionable. Mm -hmm. you know, so I think that there can be exercise of prudence where we limit the interaction or the possibility for these loved ones to be purposely belligerent. Correct. Um, all right, with that, I think I'll wrap up my contras and we can wrap up this episode <laughs> yes, of yes. Truth Be Bold. Thank you for joining us and we will see you next time.